Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing angiogenesis and angiotherapy. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing hypoxia-induced angiogenesis, and what we've studied up to now is how, under hypoxic conditions, cells can be induced to express vascular endothelial growth factor A and also fibroblast growth factor 2. Okay, and the principal one there is vascular endothelial growth factor A, and that's the one that we're going to concentrate on. But fibroblast growth factor 2 does pretty much the same thing as vascular endothelial growth factor A. Okay, so let's now discuss how this is actually going to induce angiogenesis. Okay, so let's just summarize with a picture where we've got to so far. Here are our two capillaries here, and then we've got our hypoxic center in the middle here. Okay, so this is the area with the cells in which are suffering from hypoxia, basically. And they are now going to be secreting vascular endothelial growth factor A and also fibroblast growth factor 2, the two principal proangiogenic molecules. Okay, and this is going to create what's known as a vascular endothelial growth factor gradient, or you could also say a fibroblast growth factor 2 uh, gradient. Okay, and what this basically means is that you're going to have a very high concentration of vascular endothelial growth factor A and fibroblast growth factor 2 around the hypoxic area, and it's going to become less concentrated as you go out, basically. Okay, so it's going to become more and more dilute. So you've got this gradient of vascular endothelial growth factor, basically. It's very highly concentrated at the hypoxic center. And then as you get further away from the hypoxic center, the concentration of vascular endothelial growth factor A diminishes. And basically what's now going to happen is you're going to get capillary sprouts that are going to migrate towards higher concentrations of vascular endothelial growth factor, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so firstly, let's just discuss the fact that there are receptors for both vascular endothelial growth factor A and fibroblast growth factor 2 on the surface of the endothelial cells that line the capillaries. Okay, so let's talk about the receptors for vascular endothelial growth factor A and fibroblast growth factor 2. So we'll start with uh, the receptors for vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay, so there are three receptors which are called vascular endothelial growth factor receptors. Okay, these are just simply called the vascular endothelial growth factor R for receptor, and then number one, number two, and number three. So these are the three different types of vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. Okay, and the one that is principally found expressed on the surface of endothelial cells, and therefore the one that we're concerned with, is vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 1. So that's the one up to highlight. Okay, and it's a receptor tyrosine kinase, and I'll talk about its activation in just a moment. Okay, right. Now let's talk about the receptors for fibroblast growth factor. These are simply called the fibroblast growth factor receptors, and there are four of these. Okay, so there's the fibroblast growth factor 1, fibroblast growth factor 2, sorry, fibroblast growth factor receptor 2, fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, and there's the fibroblast growth factor receptor 4. Okay, and again, the principal one that is found on endothelial cells, it's just one, and the major one, uh, is fibroblast growth factor receptor 2. There is a bit of debate about whether fibroblast growth factor receptor 2 is important. Uh, sorry, it's the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1 that's really important. There is a bit of debate about whether the fibroblast growth factor receptor 2 is also important on endothelial cells. But if you're going to note one fibroblast growth factor receptor that's on the endothelial cells, it's fibroblast growth factor w receptor 1. Okay, right. Uh, so these are our two important receptors, the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 and the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1. Okay, right. Now they're both receptor tyrosine kinases, and pretty much when they're activated, they're going to activate the same sort of pathways as each other. Okay, so vascular endothelial growth factor A will be activating the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2, and fibroblast growth factor uh, 2 will be activating the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1, 
but these will be activating the same sort of intracellular pathways as one another in the uh, endothelial cells, okay? So let's just talk about receptor tyrosine kinases and how they're activated and the sort of pathways they're going to actually lead to. We're not going to go through the pathways downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases because it would take me about two hours to talk through all the pathways of, uh, that are downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases. So we'll just name the pathways and say what they overall lead to. Okay, so we'll say input and output and skip out all the intermediate steps. Okay, right. So, a basic discussion then of receptor tyrosine kinases. So, if this is the cell membrane here, so that these two parallel lines here not represent a double-stranded piece of DNA anymore, but represent the cell membrane. Let the uh, lower line represent the inner leaflet of the cell membrane, and let the upper line represent the outer leaflet of the cell membrane. So, receptor tyrosine kinases are generally single-pass membrane proteins with their amino terminus extracellularly, okay, and then their carboxylic acid terminus intracellularly. And intracellularly, they also have a special domain, which is the tyrosine kinase domain, like so. And they have a single membrane spanning alpha helix, which is the portion that crosses the membrane. Okay, and that's here, even though I haven't actually drawn it in an alpha helical structure, just because it makes the picture look simpler if I don't draw it like that. Okay, so this is the general structure of a receptor tyrosine kinase, so named because the receptor has an inbuilt tyrosine kinase on its intracellular aspect down here. Okay, so this is the generic structure of a receptor tyrosine kinase. Both the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 and the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1 will have this broad structure here. Okay, and we've discussed how the two ligands, the vascular endothelial growth factor A and the fibroblast growth factor 2, they form homodimers prior to binding to the receptors. So what's going to happen basically in both cases is the homodimer is going to bind to two receptors and cause the receptors to dimerize together. So here is our homodimer of either fibroblast growth factor 2 or vascular endothelial growth factor A, okay? And it's now dimerized together, these two uh, receptor tyrosine kinases, whether they are uh, the um, vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 or the fibroblast growth factor receptor 1, okay? So here we go. So you'll get now a homodimer of receptor tyrosine kinases formed. Okay, and this now is uh, setting the scene for the activation of these receptor tyrosine kinase, kinase domains. Okay, so the kinase domain of a receptor tyrosine kinase is not normally that active. It's not completely off but it's not particularly active, okay? It catalyzes the phosphorylation of tyrosines extremely slowly. Um, however, it can be activated to work much, much quicker. And the way that you activate these um, tyrosine kinase domains is by phosphorylating special tyrosine residues on each of the kinase domains. So each one of these kinase domains has a special phosphorylation site, which is a tyrosine residue, which if you phosphorylate it, the tyrosine kinase domain gains a huge m amount more activity. Okay, so it will work much, much better if you phosphorylate the tyrosine residue. Okay, so when you dimerize the two receptor tyrosine kinases together, whether they're vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2s or fibroblast growth factor receptor 1s, what's now going to happen is you bring these really slow tyrosine kinase domains close together, and if you wait long enough, what will happen is they will end up phosphorylating each other's tyrosines, basically. So this one here will phosphorylate this one's tyrosine, so it helps to number these. Let's call this one number one, and this can be receptor tyrosine kinase number two. So the kinase domain of receptor tyrosine kinase number two can phosphorylate this special phosphorylation site on the kinase domain of receptor tyrosine kinase number one. And of course, the kinase domain of receptor tyrosine kinase number one can reciprocate and phosphorylate the tyrosine residue on receptor tyrosine kinase number two here. And now, of course, once they have these uh, phosphorylated tyrosine residues, they're going to gain 
a huge amount more activity. So they're going to be activated basically. They're going to work much, much quicker now. Okay, and what's going to happen now is the kinase domain of receptor tyrosine kinase number one is going to go mad and phosphorylate all the tyrosines on the intracellular aspect of this uh, receptor tyrosine kinase number two. Well, not quite all of them, but a, a huge number of them basically. Okay, so it's going to end up phosphorylating a lot of tyrosines on the intracellular aspect of receptor tyrosine kinase number two. Okay, so it's phosphorylating all of these tyrosines here. So I'll colour these phosphate groups in in purple. And the kinase domain of receptor tyrosine kinase number two, which is also active, is then going to phosphorylate loads of tyrosines on the intracellular aspect of receptor tyrosine kinase number one here. Okay, and these tyrosines are other than that original tyrosine that you had to phosphorylate to activate the kinase domain. Okay, so this process is a process known as autophosphorylation. Okay, auto means self, so this means self-phosphorylation. Now you might think, well it's not self-phosphorylation, it's the opposite um, kinase domain phosphorylating the receptor tyrosine kinase. Okay, however, if you view the dimer as one entity in itself, Okay, and there's a very good reason for viewing it as one entity in itself because a very special example of a receptor tyrosine kinase, very highly studied example, is the insulin receptor where the receptor tyrosine kinases are effectively already dimerized and that's the insulin receptor. Okay, um, so if you view the dimer as being one entity in itself, then it would be self-phosphorylation basically because the dimer is getting phosphorylated by parts of itself basically. Okay, right. So now you have the appearance of all of these phosphotyrosine residues on the intracellular aspect of this receptor tyrosine kinase dimer. And basically those of signaling proteins can now come and bind to these phosphotyrosine residues and start off all sorts of different fantastic signaling cascades, which we're not going to go through, but which I'm going to name for you and say what the overall output is. Okay, so basically let's think about what we are trying to do here, okay? We are going to majorly change the behaviour of cells, basically. That's what vascular endothelial growth factor A and fibroblast growth factor 2 are going to do. They need to majorly change the behaviour of cells, majorly change the phenotype of cells. Okay, now to do that, what you really need to do is have a massive, great epigenetic change, okay? An epigenetic shift, basically. Okay, you need to completely change which genes are being expressed, basically. So a huge number of genes in the genome are going to have their gene, uh, well, are going to have their expression level changed when you activate these receptors. Okay, now how do you produce epigenetic changes? Well, one of the key ways that we've been looking at before, okay, is by controlling transcription, okay? you know, having transcription regulators which can then alter the chance that a uh, gene is actually going to be transcribed. Okay, so one of the pathways downstream of uh, receptor tyrosine kinase is going to manifest in changes to transcription, basically. It's going to change uh, the activation state of transcription regulators, which can then alter the gene expression of a huge number of different genes. So that pathway, the major pathway in a way, is what's known as the ras raf mech erk pathway, which lists many of the components of this cascade. Ras, then raf, uh, then mech. Uh, and then ERK, and they're all uh, kinase enzymes. Okay, right. So the ras raf mec erk pathway. So as I say, we're not going to go through this pathway, okay? We're just going to look at the input. You start with your phosphotyrosine residues on the intracellular aspect of your receptor tyrosine kinase. You have this cascade, and then what's the output? You get a major change in which genes are being transcribed, okay? So transcriptional changes. So which genes are being transcribed into mRNA changes, basically. Okay, now, you actually want to produce a change in the proteome, though, and the proteome's a nice key word. The proteome means all of the proteins within a cell, basically. Okay, so if you take a cell and you characterize every single one of the proteins, count up which proteins you've got, okay, that information, that huge amount of information is what's meant by the proteome of cells. Okay, and some people do work these things out for different cells.
Okay, right. Uh, we want to actually produce a change in the proteome, not just a change in the transcriptome. Okay, so the transcriptome is another one of the ohms. Okay, and that just means all of the mRNA that's within the cell. Okay, so at the moment, the transcriptional changes has produced to a change in the transcriptome. Okay, however, if we actually want to, the change in the transcriptome to cause a change in the proteome, we need the mRNA to be translated. And many of these mRNAs uh, that you are going to now activate by the ras raf mec -ERC pathway aren't actually allowed to be translated usually. There are ways of stopping them being translated. Okay, so you also need to produce changes to translation if you actually want these mRNAs that you've now produced to actually be translated into a change in proteins, basically. Okay, so there is another major pathway that receptor tyrosine kinases activate, which basically unlocks the translational machinery to allow these mRNAs that you've produced to actually be translated. Okay, and this other incredibly important pathway is the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. Okay, and again, that uh, describes some of the major components of it. Phosphonose type 3 kinase, protein kinase B, the mammalian target of rapamycin in the complex 1. Okay, and this will then produce the changes on the level of translation, and together they both produce the two component, uh, well, the two components of an epigenetic change. Okay, if you want an epigenetic shift to occur, you need to change transcription first, and then you need to tra change translation. Okay, and these two pathways work together to bring that about. And the overall result then is that you have a major epigenetic shift within the cell, majorly change the proteome of a cell, which proteins the cell actually has in it. Okay, and this is now going to lead to major changes in the phenotype of the cell. Okay, right. So, what then is actually going to happen? So, we've talked now about the signaling cascade. We've talked about how they're going to lead to this major change in the behavior of cells by changing which proteins are actually expressed in cells. But what actually do the cells do now? What is this change in behavior that I'm uh, talking about? Okay, so let's actually now discuss what does vascular endothelial growth factor A and fibroblast growth factor 2 do to endothelial cells. Okay, well, two of the first things that are going to happen is that you're going to cause endothelial cell contraction and you're also going to cause vasodilatation of the capillaries, okay? And this is important. This is a first part of what vascular endothelial growth factor A uh, principally does, okay? And this is going to be very, very important when we later want to talk about diabetic retinopathy, okay? Because in the milder forms of diabetic retinopathy, you have elevated levels of vascular endothelial growth factor A, but this doesn't quite lead to the angiogenesis yet. It just leads to this first bit where you have endothelial cell contraction and vasodilatation, which then leads to uh, edema, basically, fluid leaving the blood, more fluid leaving the blood and going into the interstitial fluid. Okay, so let's just talk about this first portion then. Okay, so, I'm going to draw my capillary here. So here is the basement membrane here, okay, like so. And now what's going to have happened is this whole uh, capillary is going to have dilatated, okay? So I'm drawing it dilated, basically, wider than it would usually be, okay? And the principal reason that the capillary dilates when you activate these pathways is that one of the little epigenetic changes that you produce results in a higher level of ENOS within the cells. Now, what does ENOS stand for? ENOS stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and NOS stands for nitric oxide synthase. Now, this enzyme has another name. It's also called just nitric oxide synthase 3, or NOS 3. So this is also known by NOS 3. And basically, this enzyme is capable of synthesizing nitric oxide. Okay, now nitric oxide is one of the key molecules that is capable of dilatating blood vessels. And in fact, nitric oxide has an effect on pericytes and makes them relax. So if I draw my pericytes around here, they will have now relaxed somewhat because of the increased production of nitric oxide due to the vascular endothelial growth factor A.
So the vascular endothelial growth factor A has increased the expression of endothelial nitric oxide synthase in the endothelial cells. This then produces nitric oxide, which diffuses out of the endothelial cells back to the pericytes and causes them to relax, which causes the dilatation of the uh, whole capillary here. Okay, so here are the pericytes which have relaxed, and that's what's causing this dilatation. Okay, and I'll put some more on this side as well. Okay, right. The other key thing that's occurred is that um, the endothelial cells have contracted, basically, in response to the vascular endothelial growth factor A. Okay, I'm just finishing colouring in my pericytes now. Now that I've coloured one fully in red, I have to be consistent. Okay, right, so... The other thing that has happens is that the endothelial cells start contracting. Okay, so originally the endothelial cells formed a confluent layer, basically. Okay, there were tight junctions in between the endothelial cells uh, that meant that they formed a complete layer uh, that made up the wall of the blood vessel. Okay, what's now going to happen is they're going to contract a little bit and they're going to pull apart the junctions between each other, okay, so that you can now allow fluid from the bloodstream to move between the gaps bet between the endothelial cells, okay, and therefore into uh, the interstitial fluid, basically. Okay, so this is what's known as endothelial cell contraction, EC contraction, and it's one of the responses that occurs uh, to vascular endothelial growth factor A initially. Okay, so let's say the source of vascular endothelial growth factor A, our uh, hypoxic tissue is over here in orange. Okay, so here's our hypoxic center here. Okay, so it's this side that will be particularly hit by the vascular endothelial growth factor A. Okay, so maybe we won't get nowhere near as bad endothelial cell contraction on this other side over here. Okay, so it'll be principally on the side where the vascular endothelial growth factor A is coming from. Okay, like so. Right, okay, so we've got endothelial cell contraction here, we've got vasodilatation, this is going to increase the amount of blood flowing through this area, okay, because of the contraction you're also actually going to get more fluid leaving the blood, okay, and forming what's known as an exudate, okay, and that can lead to fluid accumulation in the area uh, called edema, and that's going to be important in diabetic retinopathy uh, later on. Okay, right, so those are some of the first things that occur, okay, and those can occur long before the angiogenesis is actually induced, okay, so at lower concentrations of vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, it's capable of inducing this without actually inducing the angiogenesis. Okay, so let's now say that we've got a high enough concentration of vascular endothelial growth factor A, though, to actually trigger the angiogenesis. What's going to happen next? Okay, well, the next thing is that the basement membrane at this sort of region here, the region that's closest to this hypoxic center here, is going to break down. Okay, so this sort of portion of basement membrane here, this is now going to be broken down. Now, what actually breaks down the basement membrane here? Well, it's a family of connective enzymes, well, sorry, of connective tissue protease enzymes, which can break down components of the um, connective tissue, the basement membrane, okay, which are known as matrix metalloproteinases, and I missed out one word. Okay, so matrix metalloproteinases. Okay, and for short, matrix metalloproteinases are often abbreviated down to MMPs. M for matrix, and then MPs for metalloproteinases. Okay, now, um, it's not fully known where these matrix metalloproteinases are secreted from yet i.e. which specific cells around here they're secreted from. But one of these cell types, whether it's the pericytes or the endothelial cells, is going to start tipping out matrix metalloproteinases, and they're going to start breaking down that basement membrane there and opening up this gap uh, in the capillary that f portion that faces uh, the uh, hypoxic center over here. Okay, right. Then what's going to happen is the pericytes are going to start moving away from this area uh, that um, is going to start sprouting, basically. So from this area where you've got uh, the 
basement membrane now being dissolved effectively, the pericytes are also going to start moving away from there, okay? They might recoil away from it, or if there's one sitting right on top of it, it might just come away altogether, okay? So the pericytes are going to start moving away, basically, from this area as well, okay? Then what you're going to have happen is a process known as tip cell selection. Okay, so one of the endothelial cells is going to get an extremely important job. The endothelial cell that is closest to this area uh, where the hypoxic signal is coming from is going to get an extremely important job. It's going to be known as the tip or leading cell. Okay, and it's the one that's actually going to do the migration and the proliferation. All of the other um, all of the other endothelial cells are just going to sit still and not proliferate, but it alone is going to migrate, proliferate, produce more endothelial cells, and actually produce the sprout. Okay, so, unfortunately I haven't actually shown an endothelial cell sitting closest to this. It's difficult to say which one of these is closer. They're both pretty much the same distance. But imagine that I showed three uh, endothelial cells here. Okay, so if I could redraw this, what I'd do is have one there, one here, like this, basically. I'd have this on this side, with gaps in between them. Okay, and we'd have one sitting in the middle. Okay, so imagine that there is one one sitting in the middle there, and that one's now going to become the tip cell. So let me now draw this picture updated, basically. Okay, so, again, here's our basement membrane that's still intact on the opposite side. Okay, now we've got a great big hole in the basement membrane here, okay, which is where the matrix metalloproteinases have broken it down. Now we have this new type of cell that's emerging here, which is this tip slash leading cell. Okay, which has now got these sort of um, podia structures, okay, which are going to help it migrate. These are the structures that are going to extend along and then gradually sort of get bigger to move the cell along, basically. Okay, right, so here is our tip cell, basically, and I'll colour this special cell in, in blue here. Okay, so this is the one that's actually going to migrate towards the source of the vascular endothelial growth factor A, uh, and it's also going to be proliferating and producing more endothelial cells. The other ones are just going to sit here. Okay, and that's very important, and we're actually going to discuss this in a lot more detail. We want to know why. Why do these endothelial cells here not respond in the same way that this endothelial cell has responded here? So this endothelial cell here, it got a massive dose of vascular endothelial growth factor A. Yes, it got the biggest dose. And it has completely changed its phenotype now through this epigenetic shift that the vascular endothelial growth factor induced. Okay, but why do these other ones that are very close by, why do they not do the same thing? Okay, and this is uh, through, basically, this cell that gets the highest dose of vascular endothelial growth factor A. It becomes the tip cell, and then it stops the others around it becoming tip cells through notch signaling, and we'll talk about notch signaling in much more detail in just a moment after I finish this picture. Okay, so here's another pericyte sitting here, here's another pericyte sitting here, and then if I just add on the other side here as well, here's another endothelial cell, an endothelial cell here, and an endothelial cell here. Okay, and then we'll have a few pericytes on this side too, like so. All right. Okay, so, what I now want to discuss is notch signaling in more detail because um, this is really, really important for why only one cell becomes the tip slash leading cell. However, I've just seen the time and I'm going to have to uh, call it there for this video and we will continue this uh, discussion in the next video where we'll discuss the notch signaling pathway. Uh, and how it leads to only one cell acquiring the properties of being a tip cell.